What is up? Kevin Hale giving it to you on this Sunday night, February 12th, 2017. It is Round of Sports Shots live via Blog Talk Radio. We've got a cool panel tonight. We got two familiar voices, and then we got the new guy, Heather Tungate. Heather, I'm turning on mics now. Sorry. Heather, what's up? Went to my son's basketball game today, saw a UFC fight. I'll get into that later. Nice. Daryl Faust. Daryl, what's up, lady? What's up? I just uh, took a nap during that Grammy. Uh, I'll try to wake up here to round a shot. <laughs> yeah. Josh Alexander coming out to play with us tonight. Josh, what's up? How's it going? Somebody told me there'd be shot, so of course I'm here. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. We talked about it. We I don't think we've really done it, but we, we said it would be cool if we had uh, some – keyword or whatever magic word that it every time the, that word gets said you have to do a shot and then let's see how we act at the end of the show so <laughs> it is internet radio so everything is um you know we can go all out totally unfiltered have some fun i've got a, some shots to throw at you guys but I, before we we go into it i gotta ask daryl yesterday at the uh, U of L basketball game. There was a disruption on the court, and to the point where police, security, police were involved. They took out the guy. Uh, I don't. Know, I don't know the the story. Was it political? I mean, uh, you know, what, what, what's the uh, rhyme and reason for the uh, you know drama? If you think there's a statement being made, I'm sure there's not. Other than you know, you got to have a little bit of uh, liquid confidence to do something like that. Um, Ooh, yeah. You know, you never see those things on TV. They 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 intentionally block them. They go to something else. But then mm. with social media, we get, we have to see it because people are going to talk about it. They're going to talk about weird things that happen. Yesterday's game against Miami was particularly weird because that happened. And obviously, you don't find out about it until you get on the internet. And then, like, you know, the ref uh, injuring his leg for a minute, just a lot of weird things kind of happened in that game yesterday. I heard. Um, so, I mean, what, what, what is the – did the guy have – what's the story? Did, did the guy have some purpose, or was he just trying to be cool? Um, I think he was – yeah, he's just partying. Um, he thought he would be yeah. cool, maybe get some attention. Um, obviously, you uh, got the wrong sort of attention. Have you seen the charges on this guy? Uh, was it worth it? I highly doubt it. I bet he would have rather stayed <laughs> in the seat. Um, but wow. he's just like a partying motive. Uh, uh, boys will be boys. Playing the boys because they will ran be out there card. when the dancers were out there. When the, when the dancers were out there is when he ran out there. <laughs> Nice. So. Okay. So yeah, and we know how uh, you Louisville fans like to uh, turn turn those glasses bottles up for every game. Notorious yeah, yeah. Louisville for the, the only place that that happens. No, it's not the only. I'm just saying, but you got you guys <laughs> got a. Re- it's not a bad thing. I've done it with a lot of my Louisville friends. Tailgating is and pretty. And that's why we're here now, pretty, right? Pretty, yeah, exactly. We only came right. for the shot. We came for the shots. Um, use me, abuse me. We'll we'll get it started. Um, shot number one. I'm gonna start with Heather. I'm gonna go Heather, Daryl, and Josh, and then we're gonna rotate um, topics to uh, you guys as we go down the list. Uh, Heather, NCAA released the Sweet 16. It was their Sweet 16 release party yesterday. Um, in, in a heightened effort to uh, get gain some momentum heading into March Madness, um, one interesting region, if you will, was uh, uh, what was it? Louisville and Kentucky. Our uh, Louisville was a two seed, Kentucky a three seed, but both in the East. And supposedly, these are the same. This is the committee that is going to be involved in the, uh, you know, for, for the uh, so for selection Sunday. So what did you get out of, you know, the, this uh, release? Well, if anybody watched college game day yesterday, uh, those guys didn't even have Kentucky in the top 16. And, you know, I sent out a tweet that said, I understand why they wouldn't be there, but I also could see a case for them to be there, you know? So, 
when the official, I guess, rankings came out, Kentucky was the number four, three seed in the East, which was kind of mm-hmm. loaded. They had Louisville, Nova, and I think, wasn't it UCLA maybe? Um, that, exactly, you know, because yeah. it was two teams, it was two teams that they had lost to. Right. You know what's interesting, and it, it, if you go back to college game day, Dave Billis made a point that I kind of agreed with, and this could go, you know, the same with even Duke or even Kentucky. When you put these teams and you start seeding them like this, like, uh, you know, Kentucky was a three seed, uh, Duke, um, I think in college game day, was a, they had them ranked as a four seed. What were they, were they a four seed as well? I think in the official yeah. ranking, yeah. Um, yeah, they, they I believe were, they, they were. were. You start yeah. to run into where teams could kind of be on, you know, kind of underseated. And with Kentucky, where I think a ceiling is high, as long as you learn to play defense, and the same with uh, Duke, where they're getting guys back from injury. I mean, mm-hmm. how is it fair for the teams above them? And and I'm talking about the Villanovas and, and even the Louisville's, Daryl, you know, for these teams to come into these brackets and they're, they're a third or a four seed, but realistically, they could at least be a two. I mean, that's, I, I you know, that's what you go into March and how, how do these teams prepare for – a very, very good three or four seed. I, I think it's going to make March interesting. And, and and again, you know, you take teams even like Arizona, who just got killed last week by uh, Oregon. I think, what was it, 27 points? Uh, yeah, you know, yeah. everybody and, – and here's what's weird about college basketball, especially the last few years. There is a team, in my opinion, that has stood out and said, we're the best, hands down, You know, on both sides of the ball, nobody can beat us. There's a lot of parity. There's a lot of teams that can make a run. And there's a lot of teams that I think are going to kind of flame out when it comes to March. And, you know, the good news with a Duke or a Kentucky is I think their ceiling's high and they're not going to flame out. Um, You know, unfortunately, I think a team that might be hurt and was left out at least in the ESPN one, I don't know about the official one, um, you know, I'm interested to see what teams like UC can do as well. So I don't know. I mean, in Kentucky, I think it was a fair seed, uh, but their ceiling is high. That's a tough three seed, even though they, they were the fourth ranked, you know, three seed. It'll be interesting right. to see what happens in the market, though. Daryl, uh, as of right now, as of yesterday, satisfied with Louisville as a uh, two seed? Uh, as far as that little the, – the whole ranking thing, this is playing off the college football, uh, you know, the, the projected committee's decision three weeks before it actually happens, four weeks before it actually happens kind of thing. Mm-hmm. And it's just something it's exactly. like they give us a talk about, and we're just right. going to analyze it, and we're going to argue it, and we're going to literally – our faces are going to turn red and blue talking <laughs> about this. Um, no pun intended, I, right? <laughs> All right, purple. How about a little even purple? Um, well, I just, I, I'll, I'll be honest. I hate the two seed. The uh, two seed always loses. I think this is a Louisville team that could be one of those that are so highly anticipated, like they were when once Lamar started uh, getting his momentum, and Louisville was uh, just had that Clemson loss under the belt, and then they just kind of flatline. You know, they can they can lose games. I think that the basketball team is sort of in that same situation. I'm trying not to get my hopes so high, but that Miami game was absolutely crucial, especially after uh, the Virginia game where an opportunity was lost by the team and their decision-making. Um, so you, you get this uh, this Miami game under your belt, and then you got to turn around real quick and play Syracuse again. We've, this is like the second or third time Wolves had to play a Saturday and Monday quick turnaround kind of thing. Um, mm-hmm. I think Coach P absolutely knows that – the the team's going to fall in some of those. But February is not the time to be doing that. Um, So a a must-win game um, for the guys coming back. Quentin, obviously not 100%, but he was absolutely clutch when we needed him. He's been here for three years and looked great, um, I think, for uh, getting his feet back in the water uh, against Miami. And then Mango didn't – he wasn't totally deterred by everything that happened. I think he's genuinely sorry, and the team can grow from this. I don't think they're out of the picture. As far as the uh, top 16 projected and being a two seed, I think it's fair. I, I don't think there was anything that made me turn my head or, or my nose up or any of that sort of things. Like, oh, we deserve this. This team deserves that. Other than maybe like a team like Heather said, Cincinnati. What? I'm a Cincinnati fan solely because of Cronin. Um, right. Not the team itself. Not. <laughs> 
you know, but, but they deserve to be in that conversation. I just think it's way too open right now um, at this point that, that there's no it, clear winners. There's no clear right. favorite. Um, Duke was obviously in that conversation preseason. Do I think that they have the ability to win games, a few games in a row? Sure. So does Kentucky because it's Kentucky. Uh, it's Louisville. And, and, it, and any of the top ten teams can win it. So to say that Villanova doesn't deserve this or Gonzaga doesn't deserve that right now in the, in the point of the season, it's just all talk. Uh, this will change. Exactly. I think it could be kind of fun to, to see this change over the next couple of weeks. I totally agree. Josh, jump in. No, before you jump in, Josh, let me let me point out. Let me point out one. You, the one thing that was glaring with the, this uh, Sweet 16 release is somebody like uh, Wisconsin, AP Poe had, uh, have them has them seven. They've been riding basically top ten for a while. No Big Ten team uh, made. Yeah. This yeah. So that that jumped out at me. But Josh, go ahead and piggyback off what they were saying. Yeah. No, I actually was getting ready to mention Wisconsin too. I mean, you know, they, they both mentioned UC and, and Wisconsin was the other team that kind of stuck out to me. But when you look at it, you know, they both both those teams lost today. So you know, there's still a lot of basketball to be played, and and, and there's a right. long time between now and the final selection show. So. I anticipate these rankings changing a ton, you know, between now and when we actually get to the end. But the thing that really jumped out to me the most, you know, when I, I was looking at it and, and, you know, they've got you they obviously stuck Kentucky and Louisville in the same region because that's what they're going to do because they want people talking about it. They want the ratings. That's that's why they did this. But, right. the, you know, the thing that stuck out was, you know, Gonzaga was the number four one seed. So they were the lowest one seed, you know, and they're, they're the only undefeated team. So, you know, when you look at some of these rankings, I think Duke was like the, the, the number 16 seed and UCLA was the 15. So the, the right. teams that you think, you know, you're like, wow, these are the four seeds. But just the way the rankings shaked up, I think, if anything, it, it you know, kind of leads some, to some, some transparency of what you're going to see this year. And it's not the rankings that are paying attention. If you, if you go and you look, and I actually kind of looked at it earlier, was the RPI. And it seems like RPI is going to be a big thing for this committee. And, and right. you know, some of those teams like Wisconsin, like UC, they had lower RPIs, and that's probably why they're that's not included good, in this initial release. That's no, that's actually that was it's fair. Uh, I wasn't, you know, I didn't get to look at RPIs. So, but yeah, with it, obviously, I think we all agree um, that it's a nice touch to get people talking right now. But one thing, Heather, I think that it really kind of helps because it, it does, it kind of gives teams, uh, you know, outside, you know, thinking teams that they think, uh, you know, I guess in a sense, your teams right now that are not on here, it gives you, gives those teams an idea on what, um, you know, what they need to do or, you know, the possibilities of, or that, you know, that urgency to step it up. And because I don't know, did they, Outside of releasing this, did they go deeper to mention like first four out that kind of thing? I don't, I don't know if they went that. I, I can't play any games. I saw like What's maybe a, a Michigan State uh, projected Syracuse play in game, and did you? that was prior uh-huh. to yeah, something like that uh, seemed a little bizarre too. Mm, that's that. That's a little early, but Heather, finish up. <laughs> right. Yeah. No, I, I, you know, talking about teams on kind of on the outside looking in as, as, you know, as far as the top 16, we talked about UC and we even talked, and we haven't talked about, but this is a team that beat Kentucky is Florida. You know, what's really interesting to me about this entire season so far, again, is that there isn't a team that we can all look at and say they have a chance. A couple weeks ago, it was Arizona. They just got drilled by Oregon, you know, uh, and, and everybody thought, wait, hold on, what's going on? And, and the same thing with um, Kentucky. And I think a little bit of the fear with Gonzaga is that, no offense, look at the conference they're in. I mean, and look at the rest of their schedule. So I just think this March, again, and I said this last year, is going to shape up to be really interesting. This could potentially be a March where, yes, of course, you're going to have some favorites, but there's there's a chance for a dark horse to creep in a little bit. And you want to look at teams that are hot, that are hot in March, maybe win their conference tournament, and play pretty sound defense. Any idea who that would be? Villanova. Yes. <laughs> and they're a number Definitely. one seed. And they don't oh, yeah. get enough credit. <laughs> yeah, it, 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 she's exactly right. I mean, again, they always trend up. Jay Wright has his guys in, in tune for March. 
And, and if I had to pick anybody in the top 16, Daryl's right. Villanova's one to watch again. That was fun. Daryl is wasn't. right. Daryl is right. Sweet. That's a, that, we're going to get that trending Sounds tonight. He is Darryl. right. He's right. <laughs> Good in, right. He is. Yeah. All right. Um, let's go shot number two. Get to start with Daryl here first. Daryl, um, with our new president, has come, what are we, two, three, we, what, however much time he's in office. He's, he gives, gives us a sound bite every day. <laughs> And Three which weeks. makes for great, yeah, you know, makes for great conversation on my Monday night show. And Heather, you can attest to that. <laughs> we, we we do love talking politics and love talking Trump. But one one thing, um, Mr. Trump, President Trump has has exhibited. He's very thin skinned He cannot take any type of criticism. He cannot take someone, you know, dissing him. Right. Uh, yeah. You got the Patriots coming off the Super Bowl. Several Patriot players have announced they're not going to attend um, the uh, you know gathering or celebration, oh. whatever, at the White House. And then you got other players like throughout sports, and obviously in the sports celebrity world, who gives their opinion. Steph Curry made a nice little burn at Trump where the Under Armour president or something – uh, said that Trump was an asset, a uh, great asset to the country. And and uh, Curry added, yeah, he is minus the E.T. So, an ass. So, which is, <laughs> you know, my thing is that this is going to be kind of fun and interesting on how Trump shoots back at these, you know, athletes and stuff. But your take is it does send a message to Trump's got to get this message. Understand that this is not uh, that he's, you know, in a sense that he's causing this reaction. Your, your take, us. right? Where's Carol? Ah, uh, I, I, I don't like how you use the word interesting and entertaining about every little sound bite we're gonna get every day. Honestly, it gives me anxiety and 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 just embarrasses well, it's me when I wake only up. From a, to... As a show perspective, it's entertaining for me. It's no, I, I say that oh, in jest. Yeah. But, yeah. Oh, okay. I see. I see. It's something to talk about, but that's that's it. Everybody's just sitting around. What what is he gonna say next? Uh, it's because really he is. a reality to. TV show. Um, whenever, like you said, any any sort of uh, uh, criticism, it ends up in uh, him discrediting them. When this is the most un like not credible person I've ever seen in this position. Um, he speaks in 140 characters, and he thinks that way too. And it's it is not. It's it's embarrassing, and I, if you got an invite, not not saying you did, you didn't win Super Bowl Fifty One or anything, but if I got an invite or there, I wouldn't go. I wouldn't go to a party. I don't think I would have a good time at. <laughs> mm -hmm. You know, it's it, he's gonna take it personal. There could be sixty other football players in the room, but he's gonna be tweeting about the one that didn't go, and it's mm -hmm. just it's so like makes my head spin. And I just want it. I just want it to be over because this is this can't keep going on, can it? Can it keep going on for four years? Well, I'll share my opinions. Like I don't think he's going to last four years. I think uh, Mike Pence will be number forty-six before within these That's next four worse. years. That's even worse. But but Josh, as far as yeah, Jeff Curry, yeah. wait, can I, can I throw in something else? Yeah, when he yeah, says absolutely. something like this about. His brand, this is a brand that's endorsed him for a very long time. You know what I'm saying? And they have different views. Right. This is really kind of worries me about what we're allowed to say. What what barriers are we allowed to cross? And and because, honestly, I was asking my mother um, a couple of days ago before you asked me to come on, like, why is it that, um, you know, I haven't been asked on to be on other people's shows as much as I've asked them? And this isn't you. This is everybody else that I've had on prior. And, they, and she replied with me, well, maybe because of your political and religious uh, views. And I was just thinking, well, I wouldn't, you know, not accept an invite to their show. I wouldn't bring that up on their show when we're talking about basketball and football. So, you know, and that's the, uh, the exception is here with you. We can talk about this, but I wouldn't do it mm -hmm. if I'm not supposed to. So just wondering what kind of uh, lines we can cross. And Seth Curry did that. So I'm just curious to see where that goes. You know, that's a, that's a really good point. Um, now, if you want to talk politics and religion, Daryl, you call in Monday night and you'll have carte blanche because it is over the top. But Josh, same same scenario to you. What's uh, what is the message the White House is really getting out of this? 
Yeah, you know, I'm not sure. <laughs> I really am not. And and here's the thing. Like, here's here's my take on it all is, you know, Trump is using social media different than anybody else ever has, you know, that's in that position. And, and I think he's totally using it wrong. And that's, you know, all politics aside, that's just something that's just like, dude, just shut up at some point. <laughs> but, you know, for, from a sports perspective, you know, and from an athlete perspective, you know, like like you said, the guys from the Patriots that, are, that aren't going to go to the White House, like, I don't care, like, political beliefs. Put all that aside. Like, this is your opportunity yeah. to go get recognized with the rest of your team. To me, like that should still be that should still happen. You know, you can still stand for what you believe in, but it's not like you're going to this office to, to ex- you're going to accept the award for winning as a team. You're not going to say right. like, oh, hey, we think everything you do as a president is great. And, and you know, like, you know, normally in, the, in you know in the last probably 20 years or so, there's been a pretty limited amount of guys that have used their athletic, you know, their athleticism as a platform for their political, social, religious beliefs, whatever. But when you go back into like the 60s and 70s, I mean, that was commonplace because of where we were as a society back then. You know, you got guys like Muhammad Ali and Kareem Abdul-Jabbar, you know, and the guys that were at the Olympics, you know, uh, Tommy Smith and John Carlos, I think was his name. And, and, Mm. you know, those guys made statements. So maybe it takes something like that for what Steph Curry is doing and and what these other guys are doing. Maybe it takes that to try to get a message out. I mean, I I don't necessarily believe in it, but but maybe that's the case. And that's where we're at. Yeah. Now, Heather, again, with with the President Trump, he is so thin skinned, but I haven't seen him tweet or respond to any of these athletes, uh, you know, who are saying no to. you know, the White House, the football, New England players. So, it one, that surprises me. I'm surprised that Trump has not already chimed in, you know, in his 3, 3 a.m. Twitter rant. Um, but, yeah, same same question to you. How, you know, this is, as Josh said, this is a platform for these guys uh, to show, make a stand and, you know, voice their opinion. And good thing, bad thing. So, Kevin, I've been on your Monday night show, and I've talked about people talking out of both sides of their mouth. Mm -hmm. What I thought was weird about this whole thing is Jake Arrieta, who is a pitcher with the Cubs, decided Mm -hmm. that he was not going to go to the White House when President Obama Mm -hmm. was still in office. He was pretty much forced to explain why he decided not to go. It turned out he had some family stuff going on, and he's like, look, I have to stay home. I have to take care of this. This is the reason. But let's be real. People were people were because he, I think, at some point, kind of, I don't know if he voiced support for Trump, but he maybe, I don't know. It, it seemed like at some point that he might have favored Trump, mm-hmm. and people grabbed on to what he said and thought that he was going, he was not going to the White House because he was anti Obama, and he, it, it turned out that wasn't the case. So why is it that he was asked to explain why he's not going when President Obama was still in office, but these other guys aren't asked to explain? And I get, again, that Trump is a very polarizing guy, and I didn't vote for him, and I don't, I'm don't. i not sure that anybody else you know, on this podcast and I did. But I think athletes should be able to do whatever they want. Um, without any questions, and it, and and I get a little aggravated, to be honest, at the media for trying to create a story um, because it's their it's their free will. I mean, if they don't want to go because they don't like the guy, then they then right. don't go. It, it, it if, is not if a, they, if, right. It's not the team. Yeah. The team or the in this case the NFL is not. You know they're not breaking any uh, rule by not attending. So that's right. I mean, if they don't, hey, that's what happened with Colin Kaepernick. He was just sitting on the sideline, and the media asked him why. Why weren't you standing during the uh, the national anthem? And it turned into a story. He wasn't protesting. He was just not doing something. Well, I mean, yeah, and this is what (laughs) kind of has ticked me off overall. You know, in this election cycle with the media, I mean, they're they're consistently picking at shit to make a bigger story. And and if that hasn't further divided this country besides what has happened in this election, I don't know what has. And, and you know, if guys don't want to go, they don't have to go. If they want to go and celebrate, you know, with their teammates, that's fine too. It's their decision who gives a shit. That's my point. Do you know really who kind of got this ball rolling? 
you know, who who really made uh, uh, it was a big deal that he didn't attend one of these uh, celebrations at the White House. Do you know who that was? Terrible. Was it, uh, no, I don't. Big Poppy? Uh, no, I, I recall it, it was, but I can't remember thinking the name. It was it was the uh, quarterback for the Patriots when he oh, couldn't Tom. make. Uh, really? Yeah. So th- that's that's yeah, and that's kind of who kind of got this. You know, a lot of people have pointed back to when Tom dissed Obama. That's how it was kind of said. But um, basically, they're going to question because, if you do something or you don't do it. Right. Yeah. Right. But you know, here here's the thing. My take is that uh, and I'll use Brady as an example. Brady, uh, prior, you know, I guess before uh, he he's always been known to be a Trump guy. He had the "Make America Great" uh, hat in his locker. He had it positioned on an on an interview, and I'm, I'll start. I'll go to Josh. He had a position with an interview that it was right there. So my take is that if you are using your celebrity status to make a statement, and he didn't even have to say a word. The image did 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 it all. Then you have to be ready for the the questions, or in this case, the uh, you know the uh, you know the reversal. All right, if you're going to promote Trump like you did, then you're fair game to get asked questions about the way Trump is doing something because you you did you you have set yourself up to do that. So Josh finishes. Yeah, no, I absolutely agree with that. I mean, I, I think if you're willing to, to stand out and to make your voice heard on, on any particular position, no matter, you know, whatever kind of status you have, you, you better be able to back it up and you better be able to answer the questions. I mean, it's like, go, go back to Kaepernick, you know, when he, when he was doing all his thing and, you know, come to find out he didn't even vote, you know, like if yeah, you're going to exactly. make that strong of a stance on something, at least back up what you're saying, you know, I, I, right, wrong or indifferent. Everybody's allowed for their you know opinion, but, Take a stand and stand with it. You know, back up your words. Mm-hmm. Good take. Good take. Uh, all right. Shot number three. Uh, Cleveland Browns, who, what, they won, what, one game this year or something like that, will have the number one pick. And uh, what's kind of crazy is that the, uh, who is it, the Texas A&M cornerback publicly went out and begged the Cowboys, Jerry, to trade up to get that pick because he just don't, doesn't want to go to Cleveland. But – uh, Cleveland announced, Josh, that they are reducing ticket prices. And I found this interesting where, you know, that's not the trend. You don't see teams um, to do that because in this case, the Browns are acknowledging by reducing ticket prices that they do not have a good product right now. Should teams, other pro teams who are not – and I'm going to actually, I'm going to talk about, well, no, I'll, I'll say it now. Um, other pro teams, especially the um, the markets that, in this case, my Reds, trading Brandon Phillips, who is was one of the most popular Reds players ever, uh, obviously to unload salary. Uh, and they're in that rebuilding mode. Um, but teams that... Uh, are in a rebuilding mode, or clearly, or are clearly not in contention for titles. Shouldn't they actually do something to accommodate? I mean, you, you can't. To me, you can't charge a premium amount if you're not committed to a premium product. Jump in. Yeah, no, I, I totally agree with that. I mean, I mean, you look at what the Browns are doing. I mean, personally, I think it's genius. Um, you know, you, like you said, you don't see it happen very often where a team is going to decrease prices year after year. Now, you know, I, I think I read somewhere where they haven't increased prices in like eight of the last nine years. So I think that right there says that they realize they suck and, and you know, that nobody – they got to do something just to keep their existing fan base. But to me, I mean, I, I was reading about this – and. And they're not reducing any of the prices in the lower bowl, which is where probably a lot of the diehard fans are at. They're reducing prices in the That's upper bowl, point. which are the fringe people. Those are the ones that are going to drop out. They're going to be like, you know what? Screw this. I got better things to do with 50, 60 bucks a ticket per week for, than what, That's a great, what That's the Browns a are doing. I mean, if, if they drop the price five bucks a ticket, you know, they have what, eight home games? That's, that's 40 bucks per, per season ticket that they're losing. Is that really that much money to the mm-hmm. Browns? 
versus and that could be that little amount it could be the what the difference between somebody thinking oh man they, they've lowered the prices great we're going to get in this year it's going to be our year i mean i think it's brilliant mm-hmm. they had to do something because otherwise i mean like you said they won one game last year and I mean, they're not going to do anything with the money that they that they're giving up once you get people's butts in the seats they're spending money on beer they're spending money on food you know they're still spending mm-hmm. money, and that's ultimately, from a Browns perspective, that's what they want. I mean, they they, they can deal with a hit of five bucks a ticket of not coming in their pocket. All right. That's a good point. Heather, jump in. So, you know, when it comes to the Browns, which I used to go on a bus trip every year with uh, a bunch of area Cincinnati um, police officers, um, even when they were mildly decent, uh, a majority of the fans in their stadium were from the opposing team. So this isn't, I kind of feel like this is a kumbaya by the Cleveland Browns ownership to their fans. Like, yes, we suck, but we're going to lower ticket prices so we can kind of start to engage you. It, it, it's kind of like you brought up the Reds, Kevin. I think the difference between the Browns and the Reds is, you have the Reds are in a baseball a baseball town where they have consistently year in and year out engaged their fans to come to the ballpark, whether the team is good or not. And yes, they've had deals where I think, you know, last year a lot the Reds did like four for forty in the upper level and you got a concession, you know, credit. Um, but you know, they make the atmosphere fun. You go to Cleveland and, and no offense to Cleveland. You go to a game and you watch a product that, yes, it not only does it suck on the field, but what has this ownership done to make the environment better in and around the stadium? They've done nothing. And while I think, you know, this extended olive branch, so to speak, to their fans could be a, a good thing or to get people into the stadium, I agree with Josh. I think parent, you know, I, I, I think fans are going to look at this and say, that's great, but I'm going to take my... 30 bucks and go to the local horseshoe casino and drink for free and gamble on the slot machines because that's more (laughs) interesting than, than watching what you put on the field. And until Cleveland's management makes an investment on the field to make the product that they're putting out better, they can lower ticket prices to five bucks and people aren't going to give a shit. Good point. Good point. Or Daryl, your, your two cents, three cents. Well, um, you know, you're talking about the product on the field, uh, what it's worth, and them admitting whether it's worth five bucks, ten bucks, fifteen bucks to go see them lose. Um, mm-hmm. As someone that works in the um, the minor league, uh, the farm system for the MLB at the bats, um, you know, there's a little bit of pride I feel working there um, and getting to know like the players that'll eventually be Reds. I mean, honestly, I know guys that are Reds currently Reds. Uh, uh, Jose Peraza came down from here. Billy Hamilton was here when I first started working with the the bats. And, and, you know, you get to know the guys and you want them to do well. But like you said, you you trade away the the, the franchise players, the faces. I mean, I've seen uh, Brandon Phillips down here at at Slugger Field. I've seen uh, Aroldis Chapman at um, Slugger Field. Like, you know, you you get attached to these players and individuals. And for, for the Browns specifically, they have to get in the same mentality that, they're just there. They have to entertain other than the stuff that's on the field. People don't go to the bats games because they think the bats are going to win it all. They think that these are going to be future Reds. The, and, and actually, I mean, the bats have even put this thing together where the bats are going to play the Reds. That's going to happen this year. Uh, mm-hmm. so, so, so you got to get the entertainment value up. Uh, you definitely lower the prices. And personally, when I try to go to games, I know I told you I didn't go to the Miami game because – I don't want to pay to get in there, um, honestly. I think that they should pay me to be there at this point. But um, <laughs> I don't want to pay any more than 5 or 10 bucks to, to get in. And that's not any discreditation to the to organization because I've known a few Brown fans, and they're dedicated fans. Um, they know they suck. They wish they were better. But when the things happen like the Cavaliers win it all, it's like, oh, congrats, that's awesome. Mm-hmm. Like I know you've been a fan when they sucked. Um, mm-hmm. So you know you get to watch it blossom, and um, they got to start from somewhere. So yeah, I think that it's lowering the prices, like you all said, they'll spend money elsewhere. Just get them, get them there. Well said, well said. All right, shot number four. Uh, this one, I don't, I don't know if I actually messaged this one to you guys, but I wanted to just throw it out here. So here it is. Last night, uh, the NBA 
um, did a and ESPN. Well, actually, ESPN actually it was on ABC, I think. But anyways, uh, Kevin Durant versus Russell Westbrook. You know, Golden State versus Oklahoma City. Um, nice uh, rivalry game, if you will, and it lived up to its billing as far as the the hype and all the kind of drama that played in you know played during the game. Now, the Warriors won convincingly, um, but the the notion that you've got this little rivalry, and actually, um, I'll go to Heather first. This this rivalry with Durant and Westbrook, it, it's not going to end. It didn't end last night. It just got started. But what I, my question is, or what I want to throw at you is that is it isn't it healthy? Because I think the NBA, ESPN, uh, just you know this 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 is a gold mine that landed in their lap because it it promotes the hype machine. It got viewers. And the, the angle that's going to, you know, Durant versus Westbrook part two, it, it's, it's, it was like a, in a sense, almost like a pay-per-view uh, show. Good for pro sports? I think it's good. But, you know, how, how, what's your take on rivalries to that extreme? Well, I mean, you have a guy that left uh, his former team and he comes back to play them and he's playing against a guy that uh, apparently wasn't happy, you know, that he lost his counterpart, so to speak. So, of course, ESPN is going to play this up. And, of course, it's going to get viewership because people want to see, you know, (laughs) they want to see guys like Kevin Durant, you know, go against his former team who is still, you know, pretty successful. And they want to see the drama and they want to see because let's be real here. I mean, isn't it true that, you know, at least on Russell West, Westbrook's part, he's voiced his displeasure about what has happened? So, I mean, people want to see how they're going to interact, you know, who's going to win the competition. And, you know, it, it is what it is, especially when Kevin Durant goes to a highly successful team. I mean, they they want to see, okay, is he going to go back and, you know, continue to play at a high level against, you know, his former team? And is he going to, you know, kind of, I don't know, I guess the word I'm looking for is, is he going to kind of stick it to his former team? And to me, does it highlight, you know, was there previous drama before Kevin Durant made his move? Everybody's going to want to watch that storyline because let's be real, NBA basketball, and this is going to sound completely weird coming from a Kentucky fan where there are a lot of former players in the league right now, they want to see a story because before the playoffs, the regular season in NBA is a little bit boring. I mean, and people yeah. want to see some controversy. They want to which highlight later, uh, but uh, people want to see some controversy. They want to see, you know, they want to see a story. And this has kind of been a good story so far. So yeah, kudos to ESPN. They picked up on something that they capitalized on and you know what? It's got everybody interested. Even me who only watches the NBA usually when it comes to playoff time. Playoffs, right. That's a good point. Carol, jump in. I don't know if you knew this, Kevin, but I am a, uh, as I'm an NBA fan because of Kevin Durant and Russell Westbrook. Uh, okay. I started watching, I think it was 2010, 2011 season, so it was uh, the last time Kobe won the title, I believe. Um, uh, that following season, I actually, like, you know, bought my Kevin Durant OKC jersey, and I uh, watched games regularly and talked about it and followed it and uh, this and that, and that's where I became the, the NBA fan I am today. And um, I'll do a little plug here. Actually, there was a guy in town this weekend for a basketball event. I don't know if you've ever heard uh, of a, the 125 years of basketball. So this man, his name is uh, Merle Brown, okay, or Merlin Brown. He came into town. He's from OKC. Um, he talks about the, the history of basketball and, you know, how it all started. And he gave me a couple of books. I'm going to have him on the show this week, my, my show. I'll plug that later. But, um, you know, and he, he, he thinks as far as Louisville getting an NBA team, he compares it to Oklahoma City. Oklahoma City and, and Louisville have about the same number of corporations, and that's how you get the funding to these teams. Well, when Kevin Durant and, and James Harden and, West, and Westbrook were all on the same team, it was fun to watch. Uh, they were like this uh, big three in their own sense, but OKC couldn't fund them anymore. Uh, right. They became too big for their britches, and they had to go elsewhere. 
Um, I hated seeing him leave. If he was going to go anywhere, I wanted him to see him in, in Los Angeles. But he went to this ginormous team, this bigger than life, the Monstars, real life team that that is just totally going to just uh, just blow over all the other competition and go back to the By playoffs and the matchup again. Um, yeah, yeah. And 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 as far as the game back in OKC, I'm not surprised that they this what it was. Uh, I mean, you heard that Kevin Durant was denied a, a night out at, at a diner. The, the, the yeah. owner was so butt hurt about him leaving. Like this is OKC's team too. Um, I can mm-hmm. imagine. I mean, if Louisville fans are passionate, Kentucky fans are passionate. Um, so you know the way that they treated him when he was back there, he didn't really do anything um, uh, above and beyond for OKC. He didn't win them a title. He up and left before that. Uh, of course, Russell Westbrook's going to be a little upset about it too. But he's averaging what a triple double still. He so is. Uh, yeah. So when he comes all down to it, I'm not surprised the way they act. It, it hurts. It makes me hurt because I I love Kevin Durant. I love Russell Westbrook. I wish it would have worked out with him, but it's just like that relationship that you have no control over that, you know, like Taylor Swift and her boyfriend, you, you know, you get upset that they're not together anymore, but it's not your life. Uh, Taylor and I, Swift. I wish they wouldn't yell at Kevin Durant the way they did. <laughs> nice, nice uh, comparison there. Uh, but what's, what's, what's unique about these two, Josh, is that these two are arguably two of the top five player, greatest players right now. And this, this, that, that talent is not, or their status is not going to change in the near future. So they're going to continue to be two of the best players in the world. And there's a rivalry here. It's not as big as Stone Cold Steve Austin versus Vince McMahon rivalry, but I think it has potential, Josh. Yeah, for sure. And, and, you know, I think Daryl was, was right on something. And I've always heard, that, you know, that the Oklahoma City fans are the closest to, like, a rabid college fan base. They're, they're, they're not like most other NBA fan bases. You know, they live and breathe with that team because it's the only thing in, in the city, you know, that that is their professional sports town. It's not like Cincinnati that has the Bengals and the Reds. You know, they only have the basketball team. So that is their team. And I feel like all the fans, Russell Westbrook included, they feel like the rant turned their back on them, you know, like that he just, he, he just left them and, you know, he's going to go and, and he's went to the worst possible team he could in that, in that standpoint, because now they're going to face him in the Western conference all the time. And like you said, the NBA has got to be loved because for, for those two players, top five guys to just go in and just ball out against each other, which is what they do. I mean, when, when they were jawing at half court and Westbrook looking at him, he says, okay. I'm here, I'm here. And, I mean, that was awesome. It's just great TV. You know, and right. it would be even better to me if there wasn't, like, this super team. You know, if Durant went to, like, the Jazz or some, you know, some shitty team like that, 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 that <laughs> then they could battle because right now it's not even fair. I mean, Golden State against against Oklahoma City isn't even a contest because there's so many other players on Golden mm-hmm. State. But, like you said, the NBA has got to be loving it. And, and these guys, they're not going anywhere. The, these battles are going to be shaped up for years to come. And, and, and honestly, that's when the NBA is at its heyday. You know, you look back with Jordan and Bird and, you know, Matt or Magic and Bird and Jordan and, and everybody else that's in freaking Portland and the Knicks and Reggie Miller. I mean, all those guys that they always face each other. That was when the NBA was great. And that was when people cared, like Heather was saying about it more than just in the playoffs. It, it, mm. Honestly, the NBA, it's so watered down anymore during the regular season because the guys just are trying to do it to get through the season, and that's it. You know, they really don't ratchet up their defense or anything. The playoffs is a whole nother atmosphere, a whole nother level of game. When you watch a game, you know, in the regular season in January versus when you're watching one in the playoffs, it's not even like the same brand of basketball. But that's what makes it good is if you can get these rivalries and you can get these guys hating each other, that's what that's what is going to draw in the fans, and that's where the NBA just has to love it. Oh, yeah, good takes. Uh, let's see. Shot number five. Uh, good to start with Daryl. And, Daryl, actually, you brought up baseball. Well, actually, maybe I brought up baseball, but you added to it. Baseball has <laughs> yeah. come up with uh, starting in uh, – they're experimenting in during this off time. I think some of the uh, championships or things that are going on uh, overseas and stuff. But um, extra innings to shorten the game. They are uh, going to start the inning with, uh, I guess in this case, the 10th inning, with a runner on second. 
Um, good idea, bad idea. I thought it was actually, I never thought of that. You know, that, that reminds me, remember back in the day when we used to play, uh, you know, baseball, soft, whatever, but there was only like four of us playing, so there was invisible runners. For some damn reason, that's kind of what came to my head. But uh, anyway, Daryl, um, your take. Them, them trying this, uh, and actually, Joe Torrey is a fan of it. You know, yeah. Joe Torrey's, yeah. So go ahead. Listen, this is not anything I've not heard but of before. This is a little league thing. It's, it's dumb. When I, when I was playing, I hated this. It's I thought it was dumb. so, uh, it was so much easier. You put somebody on second in one good base hit, and they're home. And that just didn't mm-hmm. seem fair to me on both sides. You know, if, if I'm if we're talking about the, the length of the game, we watch football for just as long. So that, that argument's thrown out the window, uh, mm-hmm. one. Or two, um, if you weren't excited in these playoff games, because people don't, unless you're a fan of a specific team, not everybody is watching a specific game. Um, so if you weren't watching those playoff games and you weren't excited in the extra innings that there was more, then you're just not a baseball person. So you shouldn't have, say, in what goes or what doesn't. Um, I, I'm honestly, it's, it's hilarious to me the idea to put somebody on second base. I hate. I'm, I'm an umpire. I think it's, it's, a, it's stupid. I think if anything, I'll meet you halfway and we'll throw somebody on first because it is hard to get on base. Um, you know, like that's a, it's a genuine trend that you know it could be three up, three down. Nobody gets on. But to throw them halfway there is just. It's just hilarious. Don't put them on first. Put one guy on first, and you know you still got three quarters of the way to make it. Um, but yeah, like it, I think I read that they're going to try it in the, the minors and the, the the lower leagues at first. I hope they don't do that uh, down here at Slugger because I'll I'll talk to people to make that, my voice heard on that one for sure. Will you? Yeah, I'm sure you will. Yeah. But um, but you actually you just you know I'll challenge you uh, on what you just said, Daryl, because you mentioned. The playoffs and how exciting the play, they they were the, the playoffs were exciting, but you know that 162 game season can just it, it took for for me, um, Josh. The baseball season is too long. I, I I know it's all it's money. It's there's it's all driven by you know the the coin. Um, I don't think this is a bad idea. I think for the season. Give it a shot, maybe, but not do it during the playoffs. Jump in, Josh. Yeah, no, no, I, I totally agree. Baseball season is way too long, and, and maybe, maybe like Daryl said, I'm not a baseball guy because personally, if if you wanted to start the game in the fifth inning and somebody on first, second, and third, I'd be all for it because, good God, can we get some <laughs> scoring in these games? I mean, I'll agree. When you're working those games, yeah. <laughs> I, I, I want to yeah. see. I want to go back to the baseball days where these guys' heads are as big as a watermelon and they're juiced up and hitting the ball four thousand miles. I mean, I want to <laughs> go back. Like, you want to make it entertaining? Give these guys the aluminum bats and let them go to town. I mean, just do something because the games are too long. They're it, it's just like oh my god. I mean, and and this is coming from a guy. I go to a handful of Reds games a year because I do enjoy it when I'm there. But to sit there and watch a game on a Wednesday night and, it, you know, it's a one to nothing game. And, like, I appreciate pitching as much as everybody else, but I want to see these freaks just crush a ball as far as they can. I mean, that's, that's where I look at it. So I think it's a great idea. Yeah. Uh, but, you know, the thing, it, it, in, I don't know, Heather, what's the statistic uh, with extra inning games? You know, I don't know how many. This per se would, if you looked at this past season, how many games does that impact? You know, would impact. But uh, I think it's a start, Heather, to do something to try to shorten the game. But in a sense, it's not real. I mean, it, it only comes into play, you know, at, in the tenth inning. So you still on a nine inning game, Heather. It's a long ass game. So. Speak. It's a long game, but to answer your question, roughly 10% of Major League Baseball games go into extra innings. Extra innings isn't the problem. It's the season that's too long. And, you know, what's interesting, especially about the state of Kentucky, is that, you know, whether you're a baseball fan or not, I think it's kind of indicative to where um, you grew up in the state, which Josh just proved me wrong. Damn it, Josh. Uh, you know, Northern Kentucky, a majority of the people, I know, Northern Kentucky, majority of the people follow the Cincinnati Reds because I grew up in Independence. I'm 25 minutes south of Cincinnati, so I grew up going to Reds games. 
I love baseball and I learned to hit a baseball well before I ever did a softball in my neighborhood anyway. So, uh, you know, I, I love the sport. I respect the sport. I think that, you know, maybe, you know, more than an average fan, I respect the chess match between the managers when it comes to setting lineup, you know, which pitcher do you put out on the mound and so on and so forth. So again, in my opinion, the extra inning games aren't the issue. It, I, I think it's the length of the season because it, at this point, when you hit at least the all-star break, which is in July, I even think some of the players are a little bit burned out. So, you know, what I would suggest to Major League Baseball, instead of, you know, adding a guy at second base, because it, it, it kind of, that to me equates to the college overtime role in football that everybody hates. You know, or I'm sorry, the NFL playoff role that everybody hates. They wish it was like college, what I meant to say. Mm -hmm. What I think Major League Baseball should do is, uh, honestly, they should shorten the regular season. I mean, you start in April and you play April, May, June, July, and August. And I think at this point, a majority of the MLB races, I think, traditionally are decided by September. Um, there's probably a few that are not again, I, you know, it, it, and the Reds have been involved in some of those clearly, but shorten I, after August, I mean, go ahead and start the games in September because when you start to get into October, you've already started, you know, with the NFL, for an example, and especially mm-hmm. in a town where you have dual sports with, you know, like right. Cincinnati, where you have the Bengals and the Reds, it kind of divides your interest. And I, I think if you want to capitalize not only on the business aspect and keep people engaged or fans engaged in the product that you're selling, and especially if it's, it's successful, go ahead and capitalize it before the other professional sport in your town gets right. going. And, and that's mm-hmm. why I say you cut it off in August. And instead of September, um, and that way, what I think if you shorten the season, I think people will want to be more engaged because you're doing it before the other pro sports kind of get going. Point. Good point. And, you know, my thing is that who really, who in the fuck wants to go to a baseball game where it's snowing? You know, October. <laughs> well, if you're in no. Cincinnati, that could happen in April. But exactly. <laughs> no, you're in right. Denver, yeah, it's... In, you know, yeah, New, in the East Coast. I mean, it's like, good God. And, yeah, I think you, you guys have hit it. It's, uh, it's, they should shorten the season. Uh, but obviously there's money involved. But, you know, at the, you know, Heather, you brought up a good point. You know, by, by a certain part of the season, uh, as, as the season progresses, you can start chopping away teams that are, totally out of the playoff picture and you have to think in you know, and obviously that list grows as the season progresses and you you know you know who's not going to make it and a lot of those teams uh they lose their their the audience shrinks their the the attendance shrinks they can't be making they got to be losing money too so i guess yeah my my take is that you shorten the season it, it would just it would give teams potentially a better chance I mean, because the truth is a lot of the teams start you know falling apart the bad teams start falling apart towards the end of the season and they're already out so if you shorten it i don't know what, what's the josh what would be a number that you would shorten it to uh, cut it in half you know make it an 80 really 81 game you would, season or i mean you would i oh <laughs> I just think, so. I mean, it, it's just way too long. And I mean, like I said, I, I'm not a huge baseball guy. I do enjoy going to the games and, you know, and, you know, I was saying make everybody juiced up and, you know, let them go. But <laughs> I mean, realistically, you know, or, or maybe not in half, maybe, maybe cut it, you know, cut a third of the season off because like you said, the games in April, it's still cold. I mean, I, I went to opening day two years ago and I put my ass off and, and right. you know, and then at the end of the year, by the time, you know, if, if, well, you know, I'm Cincinnati Reds fan, so that we don't make the playoffs anymore. But when we did, you know, it was freezing ass then too. So it, you know, mm-hmm. it's just the timing of the season. And, and like Heather says, you know, they they run into some of the different sports and they all kind of overlap. And there's only a certain set of time in the middle of summer that people are actually focused on on, on baseball. And you know, it, it's it's a matter of you know the the season's so long in the in the Reds and other area organizations, and I'm sure Daryl knows. You know, with the bats, they have to do certain things to make it entertaining for the fans to want to come. You know, they have all these promo right. nights and they do these different things, and, and that helps draw attendance. But like you said, after a team's out of it, I mean, 
I went to a couple games towards the end of the year last year, and, and I was probably one of like 600 people in the stands. And, and you know, I got on StubHub five minutes before the game and got a ticket for like four dollars. You know, it's like <laughs> it got to sit and potentially game. sit in the forty-four dollar seat as you, you know. Yeah, I was I was four rows from the field. You know, <laughs> it was great. <laughs> right. Good, good point. Now, Daryl, remind us the AAA season. I think. I want you to how do, tell us how many games and really when it starts and ends because I think that timing is is good. It's good, yeah. Uh, actually, I'll do a little thing. Red fans, all Red fans here, the Reds will be at Slugger Field on March 31st. Uh, it's a Friday night. It'll be 6:15. It's going to be it's super fun. It always is. Um, see both the mascots out there. Yeah, I'm a mascot fan. Uh, <laughs> but. The, uh, the baseball season, I look forward to the baseball season because it's not what we're talking about. It's not over 100 games. It's like 70 to 80 games. I, I want to say like 72 games. But when it's going on, honestly, like it's like this weird schedule. You know, you got 10 home games, then they're gone for 10 games. Um, right. So I have a weird work schedule around that. Um, but when they're here, I, I enjoy it. I like going to games. I don't think it's hard to get paid to watch baseball. Um mm-hmm. Uh, I've been there for like, this will be my fifth season. Um, I've seen a lot of cool people come through there. Uh, the cool promos we got going on this year is like Muhammad Ali weekend. There's a festival, uh, that, that anniversary weekend of him passing on. Um, so j- in June and then it, it, it does, it gets start right ar- It starts right around, uh, the Derby festival, like, um, Thunder global weekend. So mm-hmm. mid April. And then it's right. done by Labor Day weekend, so the first of September. And this is, mm-hmm. like I said, it's it's not hard to work in baseball, and I I really enjoy mm-hmm. it. No, good good take. Um, though I will never understand, bring your dog, dog night or whatever that crazy. Yeah, it's kind of gross. Uh, yeah, I don't really know. Yeah, really? Just, 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 really? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, like, really, because who wants to step in shit while they're walking through the aisles? Right. Exactly. My dog would just be annoying. My dog would be annoying to take around other people and other dogs. So that's, it's my least favorite day. I act off to that. Thirsty Thursday is the most exciting day. Yeah. I mean, I want to know, like, when Bark yeah, in the Park right. night, do they, do they actually have, like, the vendors giving around, like, are they selling doggy treats or are they still just selling hot dogs and stuff? <laughs> <laughs> They're only allowed to be on the back. They're like not allowed to be on the concourse right up there in the front where the the, the nets are. So they're only allowed to be out there where the grass is. So that's yeah, so hard. if they sit, it's okay. See, right. And, 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 and the and the yeah, the way my mind works, I would take my six pound Yorkie there and say, Reese, <laughs> go hump every dog you want tonight. <laughs> Tonight's your night, baby. Go get it. Gross. <laughs> That's foul. Exactly. It exactly. Yeah, so. Oh, gosh. All right. Uh, those were our shots. Time now, because Daryl's on a time schedule. The whole Walking Dead. I thought Walking Sunday Dead came night. on at 9. I know. I was going to catch the replay because the Grammys were on, but I fell asleep during the Grammys. Uh, they're so boring. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, our final shot, where I'll let the panel throw out their quick editorial, if you will, their their burn, their their take. I'll start with Josh. Josh, the new guy. Thanks again yeah, for sure. hanging with us. Especially it's anything a good segue because I was just watching Sports Center and I saw uh, Lonzo Ball on UCLA. So uh, I want to talk about his family for a little bit. And uh, I don't know if you guys know this, but uh, his high school team out in Chino Hills, California, they had uh, he's he's got two brothers. They were all on the same team last year. And this one kid, uh, his his youngest brother, Lamelo Ball, dropped 92 points in a game earlier this week. I so he it. had 92 points and 146 to 123 victory for them. And you know, <laughs> you look at that, and on the surface, you're like, oh wow, that's great. You know, the kid had 92. That's awesome. But if you see the highlights of this game, the kid did not cross half court on defense. It was the cheapest points I've ever seen. Like this was stuff I would have done in like a fifth grade game, just trying to. It's score like cherry picking like, in soccer. It was the most cherry picking son of a bitch I've ever seen in my life. And then <laughs> yeah, so I start time. reading about this, and I start reading, and I'm like, okay, this can't be. So his brother, that's also on the same high school team, had 72 in a game earlier this year. So I'm sure they did the exact same thing for that game. So then I'm like, okay, well, it, maybe I'm reading too much into it, whatever. Well, I come to find out the coach of the opposing team said that they started fouling at the end of the game just so they could keep getting this kid points. And I'm like, are you fucking kidding me? Like, 
Oh, that, wow. I'm all for wow. scoring points, and I'm all for, you know, you know, if you have that kind of talent, more power to you. But do it in a sportsmanlike manner. Don't just, like, I mean, cherry pick your ass off just because you want to get in a headline that said you had 92 points. Oh, wait a minute. You're saying his own team was fouling the other team yes, just to, to get, get the ball, the ball oh. back. So the other oh. team had to shoot free throws. And then the you kid, know what? I, I read yeah. the, the kid had all but one of their shots after halftime. One other person on his team had one shot. Every time, every other shot that went up was his. What? What is the motivation there? Put, yeah, but jo- correct me if I'm wrong. Though. The this is, is, this is, I mean, is kind of planned. Wanted, uh, and the thing yeah. is, it's I mean, like the kid, the team's actually really good. I mean, they, they lost. Last week, um, after this game, or maybe it was before this, actually it was the game before this one, they lost to Oak Hills, which is, you know, it's a basketball powerhouse. So this team is actually, it's, it's, they're a top 10 team in the country. They don't need to be pulling this kind of stunt crap. Just go out and play the game. Now, you know, if I'm the coach, uh, um, I'm the opposition, the opponent's coach. I don't know. I, I'm, I'm thinking, you know, uh, Big Bubba, who is uh, at the end of the bench, who yeah, um, getting laid you know, just out. made the team is going to come in and um, hip check you, you know, when you, uh, you know, are driving in for a layup or something. But, you know, I guess not. 92 that's points. Need, that's where the, they what need to book his stat on that line? team to get some seconds. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I what can't was, remember what was how his... many shots he had. He, had okay. he took up like 70 shots or 50 something shots. Hold on. Let me see if I can find it real quick. All right. <laughs> crickets yeah See, so this, he, they this, played a game two days ago and he only had 27 so we were back to normal now yeah yeah nice good ridiculous good take. yeah good take job all right heather no actually heather i'm gonna let you go last because yours you got a really cool story daryl you go well i was just thinking about what i wanted to talk about can you all right can you believe that we only have six games left in the regular season i can't believe that we're already to i saw that Right. I saw that yesterday or today. Yeah. Yeah. So that means that each squad, you know, Louisville and Kentucky has, probably has about three home games left. And like I was saying mm-hmm. earlier about Louisville period, you know, there's no time to be losing games. Um, you know, back to back for one with that Virginia, then Miami possibility, Miami. We got Syracuse Monday. So tomorrow night and then nine days it's, later, we play them again. Syracuse is one of those teams that uh, uh, squeaking up into the top four, they're becoming a hotter team in the conference, and they're they possibly could end up getting um, one of those double buy spots, which is what Louisville is playing for in this point. Louisville's never won a, a conference postseason game. Uh, I think that's what Louisville is looking for. That's one of their goals. I really think it's possible to win and get that double buy. Um, but if they do end up having to get just a single and they have to play three nights in a row, I think Louisville can mm-hmm. still make a, a a strong case for the conference title. I mean, we saw them play in that uh, – was it Bahamas or Puerto Rico or something like that uh, back in a couple months ago with uh, Wichita State and Baylor when they gave up that huge lead. I just think all these games have conditioned Louisville to, to succeed in this conference tournament, and that is the focus right now. Um, like I said, big game against Syracuse, old Big East foes. It's always fun. Jim Beheim, Rick Tino, it's going to be really exciting. Cool. All right, Heather, bring it on. Your final take. Uh, my, mine doesn't have to do with uh, collegiate or uh, pro sports. It has to do with youth athletics and parents acting like a bunch of jackasses. So anybody that's followed me on Twitter for quite a while knows that my kids are all active in youth sports. My son plays for a sixth grade team. Um, The way that our school district does it is you play with kind of like your local, I don't know, club team, so to speak, until you hit the sixth grade level. And then after sixth grade, you go to middle school ball. And then if you're fortunate enough, you go to high school ball as well. So my son plays for our uh, area team, uh, sixth grade select team. So tonight we... um, we went to his game. Everything was fine. You know, we were up 14 points. Other teams started to come back. And all of a sudden, a UFC fight broke out in the middle of the damn court. <laughs> and, I'm, and, when I, and when I say UFC fight, I am not kidding. What happened was there was a kid from the other team and a kid from our team who, if I'm going to be honest, the kid from our team has a reputation. He likes to jaw. He is a little bit aggressive. And there have been other people outside of, you know, my kid's organization that have complained about him. 
I'll stand up for him now because he didn't do anything tonight. What happened was him and this other kid from the other team were kind of shoving each other running up the court. All of a sudden, a kid from the other team kind of, for lack of better terms, bitch slapped our point guard in the face. And, and, and the, the ref saw it, teed the kid up immediately while our point guard got pissed off because he got smacked in the face, right? And he's like, come on, you know, let's do this. Well, the kid from the other team tackles, you know, fist fight happens between the kids, coaches, the refs try to break the kids up. Here's where the parenting part comes in. Our point guard's parents who, you know, Apple doesn't fall far from the tree, a uh, little aggressive, run onto the court to get their kid. The, the mom from, for the other kid runs onto the court. Words are said there. Mom, the other team, punches our point guard's mom in the face, like, in front of everyone. Oh, my God. And, like, World War Three broke out. It, it was crazy. I've never seen anything like this. So, you know, thank God my husband, who is a police officer, was there and kind of calmed everyone down. But it, it, the refs called the game. The game ended in a tie with about 340 left in the fourth quarter. My point is, and Kevin, I have talked to you about this before, and I've even mentioned it on this podcast, is that it, and you watch shows like uh, Friday Night Tykes, if you guys are familiar with that show, where they kind of chronicle uh, TIFA, which is Te- Texas Youth Football Association um, in Texas, and, and they show these parents acting like idiots and these kids acting like idiots. You know, my thing is, is when it comes to youth athletics, at the end of the day, you're trying to teach your kid to be a good sportsman, you know, to show good sportsmanship, have manners, and learn the game. I think we've kind of all went away from that, and it's happened long ago, but I've seen it more and more now as my kids get involved in youth athletics. And what I am really disappointed about is the fact that not only do you have kids, and, and, and I'm faulting both players here, not just one or the other, I'm faulting both. When you have kids that can't control themselves in the game, and then you have parents that kind of exacerbate the, the situation and storm the court and, you know, do whatever stupid shit that they're going to do. At what point, if you're like the president of a youth athletic association, do you not stop and say, you know what, it's time to remove the bad apples? And I, I, I kind of want to call out a little bit like our organization and say, you know, if you know a kid is an issue, you need to go to the coach and kind of address it. And, and, and you, need to, you need to kind of nip it in the bud in the beginning so that something like this doesn't happen. And while I would say our point guard wasn't maybe at fault tonight, because after all, he was the one that got punched first, I just think that a lot of these organizations, because they don't want to offend parents, are afraid to kind of step up and take charge. And if you're not willing to take charge and correct kids in their behavior and even go to their parents and correct behavior, then you don't deserve to be in the position that you are because kids are not going to learn their lesson. I was extremely disappointed what happened tonight at my son's game. My, my twin daughters, who are nine, were freaked the fuck out. I mean, like big girl tears crying because they see all these adults fighting. And what does that teach them? I mean, you're, you're, you're watching kids fight on a court and then adults go out there and fight. I mean, come on, that doesn't teach these kids anything. And, and I hope, and I honestly hope that our league steps up and addresses all parties involved and says, you guys are done for the season. Because if you cannot remove the bad apples or the bad seeds, you're going to have kind of like this, Think, uh, you know, over your organization for the rest of the year. And I don't think it's fair to the rest of the kids, like my son and his teammates, who have done absolutely nothing. I just think youth athletics in this country have gotten out of hand. And, you know, I, and I, I don't, and, and by the way, parents, stop living vicariously through your parents or through your kids, because not everybody is going to be in the NBA. Not every, everybody is going to play Major League Baseball or be in the NFL. Let your kid enjoy what he's doing. Let him learn the game. If he happens to be successful, great. But you don't need to fight at midcourt about it. Yeah, I totally agree. Now, as a parent, my son, see, I'm, I'm half Thai, which makes my son a quarter tie. I told him at an early age, Mason, basketball is not in your future. Don't even fucking think about it. You know, that kind of shit. You know, it's just how it is. I'm not going to. Yeah. But uh, I want to, because Daryl, you've got, you're, you, you said you wanted to chime in with a, a thought here. 
Yeah, I love that she brought this up because, listen, I'm reading this book right now, and I'm an avid reader. Like, uh, I got this, you know, two cents thrown at me. I take advice from people I really admire. And one time I had um, UL soccer coach Ken Lola. He told me, you know, you know, you should read 15 minutes of something other than a newspaper, other than articles you see on Facebook, this and that, good uh, information a day. You should read 15 minutes because if you can um, read in two weeks what it took someone else an entire lifetime to learn, why wouldn't you do that? So, you know, whenever I cross a good book that's something I want to be interested in, I pick it up. And there's this um, little cute little bookshop down the street from me, and I was running past it several times in a row where this book stood out to me. I saw the title as I'm running by. It's called Why Johnny Hates Sports, okay? You know, Johnny's the typical little boy name, okay? This book is old as shit, and it was written in 1999 is the copyright date on it. Um, but I'm currently reading it, and the, the last chapter I just read was Parents. Um, it, basically, the, the, the whole book's about putting the fun back in sports. Why are sports not fun for kids? Why did they quit it? Why did they do this and that? And what's the current state of it? So the parents section, I was just reading. I had only gotten, like, slight information when I was uh, at U of L studying sports. You know, the use of it. The, the parents are living vicariously through their kids because of their unfulfilled destiny and their own uh, victories that never happened. Um, you know, and Kevin, you said, you know, you already told your kid you're not going to play basketball. But guess what? There's people out there like Venus and Serena's dad who was literally breeding them to be a superstar. From the age of, like, eight years old, they were being bred breeding. to be a superstar. <laughs> no, it breeding. was a true story. There's I know. You're right. Little, he did. Right, he he was. This other little clip. Um, I don't know if you've ever heard of a man um, in the NFL. His name's like, let me see, it's Todd Marinovich. Does that sound familiar to you all? Uh, the uh, quarterback, right? He's the quarterback that was literally bred, um, like in a little test tube, to be the superstar quarterback. His parents paid for all the doctors and the and the the, the equipment and treatments to to be the superstar. Well, he is up spiraling out of control because it's not what he wanted to do. Um, he didn't when, want was to be out there, gambling addiction or something or. Oh, yeah, he was doing it all. He yeah. was partying yeah. and, and blowing it all, literally. Um, but at, like you said, as an umpire, I, I'm not going to tolerate that. Uh, one time I had a parent with a styrofoam cup, which I can only assume means they're, you know, it's Sunday morning, they're just seeing their kid play today. But, you know, he, they, he they're out there yelling at girls on the opposing team to take their helmet off while they're on base. And what am I – I'm just like, why? why? Why would you yell at my – players to do something like that just get out of here like if you're not if you're going to cause the scene i just got to keep my job is to keep this game moving i i gotta mm -hmm. i gotta keep it moving i gotta keep it clean i want to and i don't do it for money i don't go out there and um umpire five or six games a day to to make money i do it because i get to be around the new generation of uh little leaguers i i work at the place that i played when i was a kid from the time i was seven to 16 years old and now i've got um seven to 17 year olds out there that um look at me to to to, to enforce the rules and i want it to be done right and i don't want anybody to get hurt if anybody gets hurt i'm gonna call them out honestly i had somebody throw a bat one time hit my catcher in the neck and I said, sorry, you got to go. You keep you keep throwing this bat, people are going to get hurt. Um, that's your problem. You got to get out of here. So I, I'm not in the job of hurting people's feelings, but I also don't want people to get hurt, if that makes sense. Well, I got you. Josh, any uh, follow-up to, to, to that? Yeah, no, I mean, I, I think those are all great points. It's funny because it all kind of ties back to, to my take earlier on, on the, the – kid that had 92 like so there's three brothers the one's a freshman at ucla now i think another one's a senior in high school and, and the one that had 92 is a sophomore and and i was reading stuff from their dad and basically he's he's already said that all three of his sons are going to be one and done in college and they're going pro and you know wow. it, it's the same kind of thing and, and you know the the youngest kid i think i read he was he's been playing like four years above his his age he's been playing four years up just so he could play oh, with his man. brothers. And I, I'm sitting, I mean, tell me that family isn't the exact same way of this dad's living vicariously through his sons. I mean, you know, I, I, I just, hope the best for him, but, but geez. I just I think mean, you're it, taking it, it, the it, childhood it, it, away. You're absolutely. taking these right, four I mean, years of their playing life away just to make them yeah. better. But it's for your right. own, yeah. it's yeah. your own gain. You're put so much pressure on these little kids to succeed yeah. for you. And that's just mm. the wrong message. 
Exactly. Yeah, and you know, yeah, you guys, you guys make a really good point, and I can speak to you know kind of what happened with our local youth football organization a few years ago. They went instead of, I think it was instead of grade, they went by birth year. And what ended up happening, especially in my son Christopher's age group, was that half the team technically could stay down and play, even though they were sixth graders, they could play fifth grade football. And then the other half, you know, kind of continued to stay true, you know, to to their age group. So they stayed up and played, you know, kids their age. All these kids, and, and, and this is what we've been talking about, especially in our area, all these kids that stay down, you know, technically they're in sixth grade, they're in middle school, but they were playing fifth grade ball. What happens to them at this point? They're a year behind in development. They're going to be playing kids who are bigger or, or about their size. And I think it kind of screws them in the end because not, I, if you want your kid to get some sort of athletic scholarship, that's fine. But, you know, what happened? You're doing a disservice to them and, it, and by forcing them to play up and, and to, you know, play kids that or even to play down to make them look like the stud in their in their respective sport. I mean, you're ruining any chance that they that they may have to get an athletic scholarship. And I live in a particularly kind of rural, you know, kind of poor area um, of Cincinnati where, you know, these, these parents aren't going to be able to send their kids, especially when it comes to money, to college. So they force the athletic issue. And unfortunately for a lot of these parents, they may force sports, but what they neglect is the academic side. And we're getting ready in my school district to build a big, brand new, state-of-the-art high school. And all these parents, you know, you know what they bitched about? They bitched about school, uh, rival schools in our district combining and that it means less opportunity for their kid to succeed in athletics. Instead of saying, <laughs> you know what, my kid has a good chance now because they're going to a state-of-the-art school to get a great academic you know, uh, experience in high school to prepare them for college. And when I, when I heard some of these parents complaining, I'm like, are you kidding me? I mean, mm -hmm. you're pushing something that largely a majority of the kids coming out of high school are not successful at anyway. It doesn't matter if you go to the new West Claremont high school, or if you go to Mason high school, I, it doesn't matter if your kid at the end of the day, you know, can't make the grades to get into college, especially in our area, they're not going to go to college, period. So no. it, instead of pushing them to be successful in their respective sport, you need to push them to make the grade. And if you're not pushing your kid to also make the grade, then I want to know how the hell you became a parent and procreated because you're not doing it right. <laughs> <laughs> Boy, the needle was pushing the red uh with uh, the ladies <laughs> on this last i like that um all right we're winding down uh you guys i'll start with heather heather share with uh your social media where people can connect with you yeah everybody can follow me um on twitter where i'm most active i'm at heather tungate seven i'm also on snapchat heather underscore tungate I'm on Instagram as well. Uh, I honestly don't, you know, put a lot of Instagram posts up. So your best bet is to catch me on Twitter or Snapchat. Daryl. Yes. Um, I'm also on Twitter. I try not to put too many opinions out there because obviously we have a little bit too much going on there these days. Um, but you can follow me there at Daryl South four, four is my favorite number. Um, and then also you can hear my, uh, weekly radio show, um, Saturdays, one o'clock on nine seventy AM, the answer. And you can follow us on Twitter at K Y women underscore sports. Very cool. Josh. Your, your Twitter, yeah, uh, great. I'm on, I'm on Twitter. It's uh, Jax Teller, uh, Jax under or Jax Teller underscore K Y. Um, it's a long story, so we'll just go with that. And uh, <laughs> you can try to catch me on Snapchat. It's J B Alex Zero. Very cool, guys. You all came on and killed it tonight. Um, appreciate the the time. Good, good, good. Uh, good answers. Good stories tonight. Good opinions. So. Um, Real quick, let me plug me. Social media, iTunes and YouTube, subscribe to uh, our show there, please. Twitter at The Shooting Lip. My Twitter at Kevin Hill 423 You can like us on Facebook. 
uh, follow our, our shows, listen to our shows on Monday and Tuesday nights as well. Uh, for Heather, Daryl, and Josh, Kevin signing off, wishing everyone a good Sunday night and a pleasant Monday. Peace out, guys. I'll be in touch.